Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your goodness to your church. Lord, we thank you that you are ruling and you are reigning over all. God, you are in control. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to you, Jesus Christ. Oh God, and now we come here in your, the presence of your Holy Spirit to worship you and you alone. So God, would you be glorified? God, would you be worshiped, oh Lord? Would our hearts be open to you right now? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your goodness and your love and your compassion to us. And we pray this all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is good to be with you this morning. Happy New Year. Almost, right? Almost. Um, my name's uh, Daniel Meyer. I have the privilege of serving on staff here at the church, and we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 this morning. Philippians chapter 3, so grab your Bible, open up to Philippians chapter 3. We're dealing with verses 12 to 16, and uh, a lot has happened in this last year, hasn't it? A lot has happened in our church, I can tell you that much. Um, we've seen 20 people baptized this calendar year, praise God for that. Um, we've seen a lot of people get plugged into small groups, a lot of people plugged into serving opportunities, a lot of people getting integrated into our church. Um, this last year, our pastor was out of commission for a few months, but the Lord healed him, has brought him back. He's stronger than ever before, and so we're so thankful for that. You praise God for that. Hey, we can praise God in church, right? Hey, praise God. And I'm sure um, a lot of you have gone through a lot of things this year. I know we have. Um, some of you have added new little additions to the family. Praise God for that. I've seen a lot of babies get dedicated this year. Uh, some of us have lost some loved ones this year. We, I know we have lost a few. My grandmother this past year. Um, some of us have new jobs. Um, new careers. Some of us have graduated high school, university. Some of us have moved. We're in a whole new city or we're moving soon and it's exciting. We don't know what the future holds, but we can look back at this last year and go, wow, lots has changed. I pray though that the most exciting thing in 2017 for you was the victory that you've seen over sin in your life. And I pray that you can look back and say, yes, God has been so good to me in this year. And maybe you're just thankful that 2017 is coming to an end, and that's okay too. That's okay too. So if you're there in your Bibles, Philippians 3, um, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? In verse 12, Philippians 3, it says this, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, uh, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, this is your word. It is true. Lord, it gives us hope. And so, God, I pray that right now, Lord, as we study your word, oh Lord, as we see in your word what you would have for us, oh God, would your Holy Spirit change us, Lord? Would you change us to be conformed to the image of your Son? Lord, would we be more like Jesus Christ, oh God, because of the Spirit's work in our lives? Lord, would we allow you to work in amazing ways in our lives in this next year? Oh Lord, we dedicate this next year to you and to your glory and into your majesty, oh Lord. Lord, be with us now as we hear from your word. Lord, Spirit, would you work in this place amongst your people? We pray this all in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may... Be seated. <clears throat> so the new year, as cliche as it is, it's a new opportunity, isn't it? It's a new chance for a fresh start, a clean slate. And a lot of us think of the new year this way, don't we? We, we set resolutions. Things are going to be different January 1st, only to find out January 2nd that wasn't quite like that. But maybe that's a good thing. We can't put all of our hope just because of a new calendar year. We can't have everything riding on the fact that a new year is started, but we can say, hey, you know what, this year things are going to be different. We can say, this is to new beginnings, this is to the future, looking forward to, to see and to pray and to hope for what God has in store for us individually and as a church. 
and that's a good thing. To leave behind the past and press forward into the present and into the future. To make the next year the best year yet in our spiritual walk with the Lord. Paul, as you can see in the text here, Paul was on a desperate pursuit for the ultimate goal. He tirelessly strained himself to reach this goal. He had tunnel vision to become more like Jesus Christ. And that is the goal for every believer of Jesus Christ, to become more like Jesus Christ. In the first 11 verses of chapter 3 in Philippians, Paul explains what he has lost because of Christ and then what he has gained because of Christ. In verses 3 to 7, we see all the things that he has lost, and then 8 to 11, we see everything that he has gained. He has lost all his worldly accomplishments so that he may gain the knowledge, the righteousness, the power, the fellowship, and the glory of Christ. The key here is, and you can see it if you look at verse 8, that that he says, I may gain this. And then he says it again, that I may have the righteousness, that I may have this which Christ is giving to me. The point is, is that he hasn't achieved it yet. He doesn't have all of these things yet. He doesn't have all the knowledge, all the righteousness, all the power, all the fellowship, and all the glory. He is straining forward to it. The question is, is, is Paul a Christian Well, yeah, of course. Is is Paul going to heaven? Or is he there already? Yes. Yes. He's not there yet, though, when he's writing this. He's not quite obtained it all. He's still seeking to become more like Christ. To become like Christ in our sanctification has to be the goal of every believer, but you might ask this question. You might ask this, well, if I'm saved, if I am going to heaven, if Paul was saved, he's going to heaven, why try? Why try now um, to become more like Christ? Why am I going to um, make this my goal in my life? Why become better now? It's too much work. I'm going to heaven anyway. Why do I need this today? I love the way John MacArthur answers this question, and I think it's a good springboard for us to get into the text today. First thing, actually, he says is that it's a moot point. If you're asking that question, if you're saying, why would I try to be more like Jesus Christ? Well, that's not a question that comes from a believer, really, right? Because if you're saved in Jesus Christ, you're going to be striving to please him. But here are eight things why. And you don't have much room in your notes, I know, but if maybe you want to write down one or two of them that stick out to you, that's fine. He says there are eight reasons why we should press on to the prize. Number one is this. It glorifies God. It glorifies God. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as we become like Christ, we're glorifying God, and our biggest desire in life should be to give God all the glory in our lives. Number two is that it verifies regeneration. It verifies that you have been saved, right? As you showcase the fruit of the Spirit in your life, as you see the fruit, of the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you will see that you are saved, and it verifies your regeneration. Number three, it adorns the truth. It adorns the truth in your life that Christians should become like Christ, and, and the words that you speak will be speaking from the Word of God because you're in the words, you're in prayer, you know who your God is. It adorns the truth in your life. Number four, it grants assurance As you see fruit in your life, as you see fruit in other people's lives, it gives you personal assurance of your salvation. Number five, it keeps you from spiritual weakness. As you're in the Word, as you're in prayer, as you're seeking after God, as you're becoming more like Christ, it will keep you from spiritual weakness in your life. Number six, it protects the cause of Christ from reproach. As you are becoming more like Christ and you're living your way, your life in a way that glorifies God, you're, you're keeping reproach from the cause of Christ. No one can say he's a hypocrite or people like Christ aren't, uh, people who follow Christ aren't like Christ and who is that God? And no, 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 it, it keeps the cause of Christ from reproach. And number seven, it produces joy and usefulness to the church. You see, this is really the only way we're going to find true joy in our life is becoming more like Christ. And so as we become more like Christ, we are filled with joy and we become more useful to the church, the body of Christ. And number eight, it enhances your witness. Of course, of course, if you are more like Christ, you will be a better witness of Christ. And this is why we need to press on. 
This is why we need to strain forward. This is why we need to pursue a life that is becoming more like Jesus Christ. So let's get started here. Our first point is this today. To press towards the goal, I must know I'm not yet perfect. I must know I'm not yet perfect. Look at verse 12, the first half. It says this, not not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Not that I have already obtained this or already perfect. He's talking about those things he's gained in Christ, but he has not obtained them yet. He is not perfect yet. Um, Philippians 3, uh, Paul is dealing with serious doctrinal issues that are going on at the church in Philippi. Um, uh, the, these, these doctrinal um, uh, heresies, really, have snuck in through the Judaizers and the Gnostics of the time. Now, I don't expect you to know exactly what all of that means, but I'll give you a little uh, brief synopsis. The, the Judaizers were teaching um, that you needed Christ to be saved plus the law. So you needed uh, faith in Jesus Christ, but you also had to have circumcision. You also had to follow the law, and that would make you perfect. The Gnostics were, um, in in short, were teaching um, that you could reach a certain level of knowledge in life, that uh, they were very spiritualists and mysticists. You'd reach a certain level of knowledge in life, and that would make you perfect. In some church traditions today, we still see this teaching in the form of perfectionism, they call it. It's the idea that you can become perfect on this side of heaven. In fact, I knew of someone who claimed this. They said that I I no longer sin, I have become, you know, perfect, and uh, so I'm just going to go do missions now, I'm just going to follow Christ, I I no longer sin. And, And Paul here really rips apart that argument quite emphatically and repetitively, uh, we learn in 1 John 1, 1.8, it says that if we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves and the truth is no longer in us. So Paul tears apart this argument. He is not perfect and neither are we, not yet. You see, we have to have a healthy dissatisfaction with where we are at in our Christian walk. We need to be dissatisfied with where we're at currently. We can never settle. We have to keep pressing on and pushing forward. Never let our guard down. Never stop pursuing more of Christ. And we might easily say this. I mean, I can, you know, I'd be the first to say, like, I'm not perfect. Well, clearly, right? <laughs> clearly. That's easy, Daniel. I don't, what are you talking about? But are you dissatisfied? Are you dissatisfied with where you're currently at with Christ? Does your life showcase this dissatisfaction with where you currently are? Because I think it's kind of the same thing. If you are content with who you are right now, you're, you're kind of saying, I've arrived. I've made it. I need no more improvements. Or you're saying that there's just no hunger within you. You're saying there's no hunger to become more like Christ. And then we have to go back to the question, are you in Christ? I have five questions here, and I think the answers are quite obvious, but hopefully it helps us just think a little bit more about why we're not perfect, all right? Here's the first question. Can anyone here say that they have all the knowledge? Can anyone say that? I don't think so. 1 Corinthians 13.9 says that now we know in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Right now we know in part, not any, no one here, no one on earth knows everything, right? There's still more to learn. There's still this need to gain more of Christ's knowledge and wisdom and insight. Of course we need more. We need to be dissatisfied with our current knowledge and push on for more. Number two, can anyone say that they are fully righteous? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you could probably look back at just this morning and say, yep, nope, not fully righteous. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body because we're still sinful. We need cleansing. We need to continue to go to the Lord. Number three, can anyone say they have been perfected in power? Can anyone say that? I've been perfected in power. I'm perfect in the power of Christ now. No, 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 no. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says Paul was given a thorn in his flesh to keep him from conceit because we're not perfect in power. Number four, can anyone say that they are in perfect fellowship with God? Can anyone say here, no, my prayer life is at 100%. 
I've got this figured out. I don't think so. I don't think so. Remember Romans 8, 26? It says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with a groaning too deep for words. We don't even know how to pray. How can we have perfect fellowship with Christ? We don't even know what to say. The Spirit needs to help us in our weakness. We can't say we're perfect. We're nowhere close. We need help. We need to grow. We need to press on. And number five, can anyone say they have received the glory of Christ's resurrected body? Obviously not. Philippians 3, 20, just a few verses down from our text today, tells us that we await Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. We are not perfect people. We are not perfect people. We, we must not be satisfied with where we're at. There must be this healthy um, um, discontent with, with where we're currently at so that we would push forward and be better and better and better servants of Jesus Christ. There's a benchmark we're striving for, and we won't see it until we see him face to face, but we must strive for it now. I think that this principle needs us, uh, leads us to having incredible grace for ourselves and for others, right? All right? We know we're not perfect yet, right? I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. We haven't yet obtained this. You, you will not obtain it until that day you see the Lord. doesn't mean we need to stop or slow down, but it means that we need to not dwell on the past. We're going to get that into our next point. We not dwell on what was behind, but we need to strain forward to the future, not letting the past let us down or make us feel down on ourselves. We need to have grace with ourselves. We're not perfect yet, but keep pushing forward. And then also grace for others too. We often try and hold others to a standard that is theologically impossible for them to obtain. And our goal goal should not be to seek out others' mistakes, but encourage them, just like us, to not be satisfied with who they are now, but to press on, to press forward, Don't look behind. Look forward. Press on. We're not perfect. We have not yet made this our own. Nobody has scored 100% on the test of life. So we need to encourage one another and have grace with one another. And this is the very reason we need Christ in the first place, isn't it? Because we are not perfect. Leading us to our second point. To press towards the goal, I must have focused concentration. I must have focused concentration Look at the text, 12b and 13. It says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I love this passage. Perhaps you've read it, heard it, studied it before. It's a very popular uh, few verses. Uh, But look at the focus that Paul has in this text. Um, He says, I press on to make it my own. And then he says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul has tunnel vision for becoming more like Christ. This is everything to him. This is all he sees. This is his hobby. This is his passion. This is his career. This is his school time. This is his pastime, his main time, and his conversation all the time. He strains forward. He's going to figure this out. He will work hard at this one thing. And honestly, honestly, if if we could have focus on one thing as a church, we would be able to accomplish so much for the kingdom of God. To have focused on just one thing, intense focus and concentration on one thing. To have focus, concentration, we really have to get rid of the distractions in our life the things that are pulling us away from the one focus, the one thing. And I think we're often our own worst enemies in this department. I know I am. Maybe you're like me. Look at the text, right? He says, but one thing I do. And the first part of that one thing is to forget what lies behind. We are a people, I know I am, I'm guilty of this, that constantly look to the past, whether it's positive or negative. Just constantly looking to the past. Have you ever caught yourself saying something like this? Um, I'll never be able to do that, so I never will. 
maybe I've always struggled with this sin, so I guess this is just my burden to bear. I've always been insecure about my faith, and so witnessing that I don't know how this is going to change. How about this one? Um, Our marriage has just always been difficult, so I don't see much hope now. I've never been the father or the mother I should be, so it's not going to change anytime soon. I've never been good with money, so what's the point in even trying? The reality is, and this is just, this is so true. The reality is, is that none of the things that have happened in the past have anything to do with the decisions that you can make in the future. Right? Forget what lies behind. Forget what lies behind. That doesn't, that doesn't dictate what your future plans are going to be. Are there consequences from the past? Sure. But that doesn't mean that your past decisions are going to dictate your future decisions. Don't allow your past to dictate your future. Don't allow 2017 and all the things that happened in 2017 dictate what 2018 is going to look like. And praise God, like praise God that he doesn't allow your past to dictate your future. Praise God. He doesn't look at your past and say, well, that determines what's going on for you next. No, this is the gospel. Do you believe it? Do you truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that if you believe in him, your your past is wiped away? Your sins are covered. You are a new creation in him, that he died to pay the penalty for your sin. There's a fresh start. There's a clean slate There's no need to look to the past, but we can look forward. Do you believe? See, if you haven't believed in Christ, then you do need to worry about your past. But Christ has made a way for you. Christ has looked down and he has made a way for you by dying on the cross. That if you believe in him, you can be saved. And your past and your sins are all wiped away. He died so you can live. You see, we can look at our past and look at all of our sins and all of our problems and all of the things that we've done terribly, which we all have, but we can also look to our past at our accomplishments. But those are also done. We cannot rely on past victories to get us through the future. Right? Look at me, I've done so much. We love just to show off our resume, don't we? The past might be a good indicator of what a person will do, but there are no guarantees in this life apart from Jesus Christ. Jeremiah reminds us that the heart is wicked and desperately sick, and that doesn't change because of your past. So we need to stay focused, stay on track with one thing in mind. Um, In uh, grade nine in high school, I really wanted to play football. Never played it before. I begged my mom, and she relented and let me play football for a year. I hated it, and I wasn't very good at it at the end of the day, but um, they let me be the kicker. I could kick the ball pretty far, so I I was the starting kicker on the football team. And uh, I remember one day in practice, well, maybe it was like a week in practice, I wasn't doing very good, or I don't know if I hurt my leg. I just couldn't kick the ball very far. It wasn't working. My form was off. It, it was very terrible. And the coach came up to me, and he said, uh, Daniel, like, what is this? I can't start you. I can't put you on the field with this kind of kicking, this performance. I, get, I need you to get it down the field. And so, like any 15-year-old would do, I started to defend myself, right? Well, yeah, but, I mean, like, just look. Like, last I was kicking it, like, 60 yards. I was getting it to the end zone on the other side. And I thought that was a pretty good argument, right? Like, look what I can do, see, see? And I remember this, I'll never forget. He looked at me and he said, yeah? Well, what are you doing for me lately? It's so true. It's so true. My past didn't matter. Am I performing now? What am I accomplishing today? That is what matters. Am I producing results right now? We cannot coast through our spiritual lives on what we did in the past. What's going on right now? How are you becoming like Christ today? You can't look back, Christian, and say, oh, I remember that time five years ago when I just had such a sweet, deep time with the Lord. It's like, well, what about today? The Spirit hasn't changed. What about today? 
He's still available. His word's still there. He's waiting for you to call out to him. What about today? What are you doing today, right now? The second part of this is straining forward. So we see we, we, we forget what lies behind and we strain forward to what lies ahead. The word straining forward, it literally means stretching oneself out as far as possible with maximum effort, giving everything you've got to make this happen. Make this your one thing, the only thing worth living for, the only thing worth straining for. Remember that verse in Matthew 6, uh, 33, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be added to you. Right? Seek first the kingdom of God. Strain forward to that. Make that your one focus. Don't be bogged down by all of the distractions. Seek first the kingdom of God. Strain forward to become more like Christ. And why do we press on for this? Why is this my one thing? Why is this my life goal? Why is this so important? Why does Paul press on, strain forward, and then say, press on again? This is why. This is why. Look at, look at the uh, second half of 12. It says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You see that? I press on. Why? Because Christ has made me his own. When you make this your one thing, when you make this your goal in life, it is, it is now consistent with what Christ's goal is in your life. When you make this your goal, it lines up with Christ's goal in your life. To say it another way, when I'm, I'm, I would be pursuing the, the very same thing that was the reason why Christ pursued me. Remember Romans 8.29? It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Why? Why did he foreknow you and predestine you and save you? It says, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he may be the first among many brethren. Literally, the reason that Christ has saved you, that he foreknew you, that he predestined you, that he elected you, that he, he, he justified you, the reason why he's going to glorify you one day is because you would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. This is your purpose. This is why you have been saved. This is what he has saved you toward. But to do this, we need some motivation. If we don't have motivation, we'll fizzle out pretty quick. And so our third point is this. To press towards the goal, I must have heavenly motivation. I must have heavenly motivation. Take a look at verse 14 in your Bibles. It says this. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here's another reason Paul does this. Here's a reason why all of us should do this. For the prize. There's a prize. Do you know that? We're doing this for the prize. We're in this uphill spiritual battle our entire lives. And we've already said we need to be constantly focused and have intense focus. And we need to constantly be pressing on. But pressing on for what? Pressing on to what? The prize. The prize. We need to be able to see what is coming at the end. Heaven. Glory. Perfect union with Christ. A crown that will be placed on your head. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy that he has fought the good fight. He has run the race. He has kept the faith. And because of that, there's a crown of righteousness awaiting him on the day that the Lord will place on his head and will place it on every head of anyone who loves the appearing of Jesus. There's nothing wrong with saying you're looking forward to heaven. You should be looking forward to heaven. You should crave heaven. You should crave that perfect union with your Savior I remember I was having a conversation here with someone maybe two years ago, um, and they just were saved. They just came to know the Lord, and I was just asking them this question, just confirming. I just wanted to hear from them. Why do you love Jesus? Like, wh what's going on? And I asked them, so why, why do you want to be, why are you a Christian? Why did you accept Jesus? And his answer was, because I want to go to heaven. A good answer. Good answer. You should want to go to heaven. That is a good reason to follow Jesus Christ. You should want to go to heaven. No one should want to go to hell. You should want to be on the winning team. Look forward to heaven. It's a good thing. Let me ask you this. Has any athlete, have you ever seen a professional athlete? I mean, 
top of their game. They're seeking the highest prize in their sport. And I mean they really desire it. Have you ever seen one of these people um, show up to a game and go, ah, I'm not going to really try hard today. I'm, I'm not going to really run at a full pace. I'd hate to work too hard and get tired. I might get in the way of everything else going on. I, I'm also going to skip training for a few weeks. I just, you know, if I win, I win. If not, man. Never, 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 never. Hard work in private and in public. Non-stop training and absolute devastation if they don't reach the top. And that's the way it needs to be for us. That needs to be our attitude. Devastation if I'm not doing everything I can to reach the top. If I'm not doing everything I can to gain that prize, that gold, the heaven, the glory. I can see the prize and I want it. I want it bad. I can't have it right now, but I can strain forward towards it. I'm not perfect, so I need to be focused. I need to be motivated by the prize that awaits me and is guaranteed to me if I am in Christ. And if I'm in Christ, I will be motivated to be who Christ would have me to be. Um, after my very unsuccessful career in football, um, I, uh, I decided to play soccer in high school. Enjoyed that a lot more. And um, my coach, who was, he was a funny guy, but he was being partly ironic, partly serious, partly funny when he would say this to us before every single game, he would say to us this. He would say, hey, hey guys. None of this, we play to have fun nonsense, all right? We play to win. Winning is fun, all right? No one plays to lose. We don't train every day. We don't get on this bus and travel. We don't go to these things so that we can lose. No, no, no. Losing is devastating. Winning is fun. So true. Maybe I'm a little too competitive, and you can see into my psyche a little bit right now. That's okay but we should compete to win the prize. We should be competing to win the prize. The exact same thing goes for our life in Christ, but to a much more important degree. If any athlete can train every single day to reach an earthly goal, how can we not work harder? How can we not strive harder? How can we not press on towards what God has called us to in Christ Jesus? We need that heavenly motivation, to look at the prize of the upward call of God. Being, the Christ, being a Christian is the highest calling anyone can receive. Do you believe that? Being a Christian really is the highest calling. God has called you to be one of his children. God has called you out of darkness and into his glorious light. God has called you to an eternity of glory. And so look at your calling. Look what God has called you to. Look at the prize that awaits you, just like Paul did, and be motivated to press on through life to become more like Jesus Christ. We need this motivation because life is not always perfect. Life is not always easy, and things get tough. If we don't have the motivation, if we don't have that gospel-centered motivation, we'll fizzle out pretty quick. Do you lack motivation today? Do you lack motivation right now? Did you lack motivation to get up out of bed in negative 28 degree weather and come to church this morning? That was tough. Praise God that you're here. But consider these amazing truths about who God is and Jesus Christ is. Really, really. Like I, I'm, the, the point of this sermon today, really, is to light a fire in our backsides, okay, and to propel us forward to serve Jesus Christ. That's what I'm doing here, okay? This is the point. And we need to be motivated, and, and to be motivated, we look no further than the gospel. If the gospel doesn't motivate you to be more like Christ, nothing will. And I have nothing else to say. But look at these amazing, simple truths. These are like Sunday school truths. But look at these amazing, simple truths. I have five simple truths for you that I believe if you woke up every morning and you just thought about these things, and you... Uh, meditated and prayed through these things and thought of the implications of these things, your worship and your life in Christ would go from here to here. If you came into the worship center five, ten minutes before the service started and you thought through these things and the implications of these things and you just really thought about who your God is 
And what it means for your life, your singing would go from here to here. Because you can't resist. My God is so good, how can I not praise him? How can I not worship him? So let's look at these. Number one, Jesus is fully God and fully man. You're like, yeah, yeah, I know. Basic truth, right? Jesus is fully God and fully man. Just, like, just let that doctrine and that, the beauty of this theology just sink into your heart and mind and let it change you. Jesus Christ, who was in perfect unity with the Holy Spirit and the Father for all eternity in harmony and perfection and in perfect love, needing nothing, decided to create the world to create matter, to create us, and that world hated him and sinned against him and rebelled against him. And Jesus Christ, who could have just wiped it off, just destroyed it, needing nothing, decided out of love to become part of creation. Fully divine, putting on humanity, becoming a man who needs to eat and drink and breathe. Why? So he could save you. So he could save you, not needing nothing, but giving up so much. Number two, Jesus dies as our substitute. Jesus died as our substitute. Just, like, just think about that. Think about that. Jesus came to earth as a baby. We just saw Christmas, right? Jesus came to earth as a, as a helpless baby, lived a sinless life, fully righteous, did nothing wrong, only helped, was betrayed and murdered. Why? So that you could live. So that you could have life. So that your sin would go on him and his righteousness would go on you. You just think of the last thing you can think in your head of your sin. The last thing you did that was um, dishonoring to God. He's taken it away. And he's placed the righteousness of Christ on you. It's amazing. It's amazing. Number three, Jesus rose bodily from the grave. Like, yeah, we talk about this all the time. On the third day, he rose. Don't, like, don't just fly over that theology. Like, just think that through for a second. Jesus rose bodily from the grave. This is amazing. This is amazing. Have, here's a question for you. Have you ever seen someone who was dead, like have you ever seen a dead body and then that person was no longer dead? Anybody? No, of course not, right? That would be insane, that would be crazy. You would jump out of your chair and probably run and like there was a zombie apocalypse or something going on, right? It's amazing! Jesus rose bodily from the grave. Hundreds of people saw him after he was crucified, after he was stabbed in the heart. He was dead. He was dead, dead, dead. And he rose from the grave. I love this story. My, my best friend, since we were 12 years old, still my best friend today, he got saved when he was about 24. Praise the Lord. It was amazing. And he actually got baptized right here. And um, when he was a new believer, he was being discipled. Uh, and uh, he was reading through um, a book called Basic Christianity, John Stott. Good book for new believers. Uh, for anyone, really. And uh, he was reading through that. I suggested it to him. And he got to a part in the chapter, he was talking about the resurrection and, 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 and all of that. And, and uh, he, it's, the study was on John 11. And you know the story of John 11? Um, Lazarus, remember that one? Right, Jesus' friend Lazarus. And so Lazarus is dead, right? And uh, Jesus is raising him back, from the life, uh, back to life. And, and so he calls me. He's like, hey, hey, Daniel. Okay, so John 11, like that should just like spark my interest. I'm like, yeah, what about John 11? <laughs> okay, he's like, Lazarus? I'm like, yeah, okay. He's like, so he was dead, right? He was dead? Like, yeah, yeah. And then Jesus just like spoke some words over him and then he was alive? I'm like, yeah. And he was like really dead. Like, I think the Bible says he's, he stunk, right? He was that dead. And then he was alive and like people saw this, like the Pharisees saw this, the people who hated Jesus saw that Lazarus was dead and then he was alive? I'm like, yeah. He's like, how is not everybody a Christian? Because resurrection is a miracle. <laughs> it's amazing. And they saw this. And, and look back to your Savior. He, he defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated the grave. And he rose again. 
It's amazing. It's amazing. Number four, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Right now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. After he rose, he was on earth for 40 days, and he called his disciples to him, and, 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 and he said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he arose, he ascended into heaven, and now he is ruling and reigning with all authority and all majesty in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And we worry about what tomorrow will bring. And we worry about this afternoon when Jesus Christ is seated on high and he knows and he rules and he reigns and he loves you. Number five, Jesus will return to earth in power and glory. He's coming back. He's coming back. This is our hope. He's promised he will, he will come back and he, will, he came as a baby, but he's going to come back as a king. And he's ruling and reigning in all power and glory. And he will wipe away every tear and he'll make all things new. Honestly, though, if that doesn't stir your heart towards Jesus Christ, if that doesn't motivate you to be more like him, to run the race a little bit harder, to fight the good fight with everything you've got, then you've got to get right with the Lord. Like, I mean today, like, like right now, cry out to him, Lord, change my heart to want, to want you. Lord, change me, oh God, to, so that these truths would penetrate my heart and I would, and I would see my Savior with brand new eyes and I would want to be more like you. And this leads us to our last point. To press towards the goal, I must depend on divine help. I must depend on divine help. Look at verse 15. It says, let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Because we are not perfect, we need divine help. We need the Lord to reveal to us our need to press on and strain toward the goal. He will show you. It says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Let those of us who are mature think this way, that we have nothing but the Lord, that we can't rely on our past, that we have to fight for every moment. We cannot think that we are perfect, so we have to not be content with who we are, but we need to push ourselves forward and see the goal and, and move towards it. We must press on. We have to make sure that our goal in life matches Christ's goal for our lives. And if we don't, if you don't see that, allow God to show you. Allow God to mature you and to see this. Ask for divine help. God, please show me my need for you. Show me my lack of desire, Lord, and change me. He needs to show us that our prize is not of this world, that our life has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that our life should reflect that. Do you need to pray this today? Do you need to pray this right now? I wrote down a short prayer. I'm going to read it over us. And maybe you need to pray this prayer right now. I need this prayer all the time. Here it is. Lord, help me. It has been too long since I have been motivated and focused. Would you please allow me to hold true to what I have attained in Jesus Christ and would that change my life? Lord, I, I want to receive the joy that you give to faithful servants. Let my life be lived for your glory, your will, your mission, your church. And would I receive the crown of righteousness on that day because of the work that you have done. Lord, change me to be conformed to the image of your son. I think all of us can use that prayer and all of us now, we can not look behind. Don't look at 2017. Don't look at the past. Don't look at the failures. They're done. But strain forward to what lies ahead and what Christ has promised you. Look forward. Be motivated because Christ will place a crown on your head one day and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace, your goodness, oh God. Your goodness, Lord, that you will never leave us or forsake us, oh God. And that regardless of how hard life can be at times, oh God, you are there. Lord, you are good. Oh God, you use different things in our lives to to show us, Lord, that we need more of you. Lord, you, you put things in the way, oh God, so that we would not be distracted by this world and that we would be focused on the one thing that we should be focused on. Lord, I pray for everyone here. Lord, I pray for myself, oh God. Please, oh Lord, allow me to live a life that glorifies you. Lord, would this next year be the best year yet in my spiritual walk with Jesus Christ? Lord, would this next year be the best year yet for our church? Oh Lord, would you use us, oh Lord? Would we be effective and useful for the mission of your gospel? Oh Lord, please, oh Lord, use us. We are so needy of your grace and your spirit. Lord, we love you, oh Lord. Please change me. Change me, oh God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.